Good morning. This morning we're going to continue our study or our look at the book of Revelation. We're going to be in chapter 1, so I hope you'll get your Bibles, follow along, and let's talk. Let's look. Let's listen. What a great time we had looking at the intro, but remember the importance of seven and several things that we mentioned in the intro that are important. The signs and symbols, the word in verse one that says signify that certainly could be translated apocalyptic or apocalypse, and that's where a lot of folks jump off and try to look at it. But really the, the best translation for that is what we have, and that's Revelation. And that's exactly what we're going to be looking at this morning. Chapter 1, we're going to look at the first eight verses. Let's read that, and then we will come back and talk about those verses there in Revelation 1. Again, I hope you'll get your Bibles and follow along with me. Revelation 1, beginning with verse 1, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. He sent and signified it by his angel, unto his servant John, who bear record of the word of God, testimony of Jesus Christ, and of all things he saw. Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you in peace from him which is, which was, and which is to come and from the seven spirits which are before his throne. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loveth us, wash us from our sins in his own blood, hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he cometh with clouds. Every eye shall see. And they also which pierced him and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him, even so. Amen. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is, which was, which is to come, the Almighty. Wow. In just eight verses, we began to open up the book of Revelation. We begin to open up the signs and the symbols and the things which are discussed there. Remember, verse 1 tells us very clearly the revelation is of Jesus Christ, which God gave him. So it is a revelation of Jesus Christ, the unveiling, if you will, of this apocalyptic literature, of this revelation that is clearly there. Note, that there is just one revelation. Uh, be really careful when you talk about the book and not using it. Plur it's a plurality of them looking at the book of Revelations. It is one revelation. And uh, revelation came from God. The revelation is about Christ. And it's through the angel to John. So it's good to understand that to lay out the basic foundation of of certainly the direction we're going for the entire book. It's not like uh, uh, maybe some of the other books, obviously, because of the way in which it is written. And the message there was signify. This was a conveyance of a series of signs and symbols. Therefore, the book is filled with figurative language, and those that want to look at the book and take it completely literally miss the whole point of the book. And thereby, that's why so many will look at the book and put everything that's in the book of Revelation some 2,000 plus years later and look at the problems that you have with that. Because the book is clear and the book tells us, the word translated shortly when we talk about shortly come to pass, it can be translated in several ways. Again, context, context, context. One word can certainly have some different meanings depending on the context in which we are looking at. So depending on that context, it can mean quickly. And that's why some have grabbed on to the idea of, well, it doesn't mean 
necessarily that it's right now, but quickly is what it has to do, or speedily. You can certainly look at that as well, referring more to how fast it's going to happen, huh? And it can also refer to events that are going to be taking place soon, and that's what we're really looking at here. We've got some events that are about to happen. These are events that were going to encourage the people of John's day. Wouldn't be a great encouragement to tell the folks, hey, want to encourage you, but these things aren't going to happen for over 2,000 years from now. How much of an encouragement would that be to you? If I told you today, I'm going to give you an encouraging message, but it's not going to happen for several thousand years. You say, well, so what? Uh, it's going to have no impact on me in 2,000 plus years and, or any of the family that I currently know in 2,000 plus years or anybody I know. So verse 2 there, when we look at verse 2, he says, who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things he saw. We know that the report that's coming in is accurate and the report that's coming in is reliable. It's got that seal of approval on it from Almighty God. And we can see that. John wants it to be known that he faithfully recorded what was revealed. That's it. He recorded what was revealed. He didn't fall short of it. He didn't go beyond it. And we're going to be reminded of the dangers of adding to or taking away from this prophecy or for that matter, for the, from the word of God. And so when we began to look at this, he makes it clear that this revelation was indeed, this revelation was indeed the word of God. Go over into the very end of the book of Revelation, chapter 22, verse 18 and 19, where he says, For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of this prophecy of this book. If any man add unto these things, God will add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. If any man take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. That's some pretty serious consequences. And yet there's a lot of folks today that have completely ignored it. They've ignored it because they feel like history, they feel like other things are more important than doctrine or than the truth. Many will say, well, that's your truth. Well, that's not a your truth and my truth. It is God's truth. That's what we better be concerned with because that's what we're going to find as we look at the closing days of this life and we look at those final chapters that are absolutely my favorite, talking about opening up the gates of heaven and that eternal existence that the faithful will have. When we look at chapter or verse 3 of this chapter, we find a blessing right off the bat. We are blessed. He says, blessed is he that readeth and those that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein again for the time is at hand. Shortly come to pass, time is at hand. In the context, you can't miss it, can you? These are things that were for the folks of that day. Yeah, there's some things as we get 19 through 22, that are very important in, in our existence and in our looking towards that final. But these were things that they would understand and were the signs and the symbols in, in their day. And the verse begins again with the first seven blessed statements that we're going to find in this book. So all those that hear the words and keep them, uh, you can look James 1, 22, obviously, uh, then one is capable of understanding the words of this prophecy uh, uh, to the degree that one can obey it. Now, something I always talk about when looking at prophetic teaching, whether it's the book of Revelation or wherever it may be, there's no new teaching in the prophetic language. If you find new teaching there in the prophetic language, I will guarantee you if it's something that applies to your salvation, it is in the plain teaching of the scriptures. You don't have to decode 
what God wants you to do to be saved. You don't have to decode what he wants you to do to remain faithful. So when folks go over into the book of Revelation and think they've unlocked some new doctrine or some new teaching, <clears throat> they have not. And so that's what we have to keep in mind as we go through the book of Revelation. And that's what we have to keep in mind when we interpret. Uh, let the Bible, let the chapter and the verses and going back to the Old Testament, books like Daniel and Ezekiel, let them unlock and determine your interpretation. Not what others have said, not what commentaries have put forth, but let the word of God define itself. It will. It is living. It is a living word. And so let it define itself. So we can understand it. He says time is at hand because we need to take heed because these things that are mentioned are about to happen. These things that, that are mentioned are soon going to begin to occur. Verse 4 and 5. Look at that. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace from uh, him which is, which was, which is to come, and from the seven spirits which are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, his faithful witness, first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the king of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. First off, there are those that will deny that the seven churches are literal churches. And what they say is, it's more about the things that are addressed to those seven churches that would occur in future events. Uh, things that we talk about with Laodicea or Smyrna or wherever it may be, these things would also occur later on in, in a particular biblical time period, uh, even as we get to the current day. That's how many from the premillennialists premillennialist and others will begin to try to define these events as being more current to our day than current to John's day. And that's just not the case. And we'll see that as we go along here in Revelation 1. So, actual, actual seven churches, because these were actual seven cities that these seven churches were in. And so, when you look at these things, the other part of that is <clears throat> no one usually looks to the book of Revelation and discuss baptism. But there it is. There it is. When you look at uh, verse 5, from Jesus Christ, who's a faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us, here it is, and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Well, how are we washed from our sins? Well, Romans 6, 4 says we're buried in baptism. Acts 2.38 says that we are to repent, be baptized, everyone in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Blood's not in the water. The obedience is the part. We come in contact with blood when we bring together that belief or faith, that repentance, confession, and then that watery grave of baptism. That's where we find remission of sins. The Apostle Paul reminds readers and those that Ananias asked him, Acts 22, verse 16, what are you waiting for? Arise, be baptized. Wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Calling on the name of the Lord is not a vocal exercise that one has asking Jesus to come into their heart. Calling on the name of the Lord means obedience to the terms and the conditions that our Lord has set forth. So remember, who Jesus is addressing, who John is writing to in these seven churches, it is those that have been washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. Those that have remission sin, those that are first century Christians, those that have done those things that you and I must do. And so he speaks of that right here in addressing as we get into the context, first begotten of the dead, prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loveth us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. That's Christ. It's his blood. And if you've been washed in the blood of the Lamb, then you're a saint. You're part of this that we're talking about here. And it uh, tells us how we're washed. Uh, these people of the seven churches in Asia obviously have been baptized uh, in a very clear and precise way that we're looking at. And so 
as you go on and, and you begin to look at this, the the things that are written, uh, look at verse six, and and it's interesting here, hath made us kings and prince, or kings and priests, excuse me, unto God and his father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. It's interesting that it is the past tense, made us, made us a kingdom of priests. If you're a New Testament child of God, you are a priest. Now the world says, what? That's what the Bible tells us. Whether it's the word priest or the word saint, don't let the world define it for you. Let the word of God define it for you. And when you do so, you will see how important it is that each Christian is a priest and how important it is to offer worship directly to God the Father. 1 Peter 2, 5, we know each Christian is a citizen of Christ's kingdom. Colossians 1, 13 and 14, we're translated into that kingdom when our sins are washed away in baptism. And again, Acts 22 and verse 16. So all of these things come together to help us fully understand. And as we get into the book of Revelation, we're also going to be talking about some things from the Old Testament that are literally the keys in books like Daniel to unlock what we're trying to understand in these signs and symbols and that the Christians understood, certainly in the New Testament. Verse 7 makes it very clear Jesus is coming back, but not like the world thinks and not like many religious folks think. Behold, he cometh with clouds. Every eye will see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindred of the earth shall wail because of him. Oh, yes, he's coming back, but he's coming back in the clouds. He's not coming back to set foot on this earth. He's not coming back to set up some political kingdom or some religious kingdom. The church is here. And so when we talk about him coming back, so many seem to be so confused when we look and we understand what Jesus went through when he was here in the first place. Why would he want to come back and set foot on this earth? When we began to look and we began to understand so many of the uh, admonitions that we have in Titus uh, chapter 3 and verse 5, where he says, not by works of righteousness, which we've done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing, the regeneration, the renewing of the Holy Ghost. Again, understanding baptism and how all of these things will work. But the clouds is as close as he's going to get. When we look at things like uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse uh, 18. There Paul writes, Wherefore comfort one another with these words. We certainly need to understand uh, where Christ is coming and, and how he's coming. And as you back up there in verse 16, the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, the voice of an archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Where are we going to meet him? We're going to meet him in the air. Why don't we meet him down here? After all, the world says and religious Folks, a lot of times say, well, this is what he's going to do. No, we're going to meet him in the air. And again, remember, we've got the figurative and the symbols and the prophetic language, but we've also got the plain teaching in the book of Revelation. Context will determine what's what and which one we need to look to in that way. We need to understand no physical earthly kingdom will be established. It's the church. That's the kingdom that was to be established. And the Bible is not unclear about that. Verse 8, we can see very clearly when we look at verse 8 of Revelation 1. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> that he says, I am the Alpha and Omega. He is our everything. We sing that sometimes, don't we? He's my everything. He is my all. Well, he is. I am the Alpha and Omega. Alpha is the first letter in the Greek alphabet. Omega is the last. It would be like us today in the English language 
Ang English language saying he is A to Z and everything in between. He is our everything. He is our all. And that's what we see in verse 8. I am Alpha and Omega, beginning and the ending, saith the Lord. Now look at this. Which is, which was, and which is to come, the Almighty. Wow, that first paragraph just blows it up. Sets the foundation for where we're going. He is, he was, and what's to come. He's everything. And the more we understand that, the better we're going to be equipped in understanding there was never a time that Jesus Christ didn't exist. Oh, we don't talk about the pre-existing Christ much, but he's always been there. John, uh, Genesis chapter 1, John chapter 1, Genesis 1, in the beginning God. It's the plurality of God. It was the Godhead, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. John chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word, that Logos, living Word, that's Christ. He's always been. He's always been, and he always will be, and that's what's so important because he's eternal. He's eternal. He's all-powerful. This is something that should be a, a tremendous encouragement for the Christians in John's day and for you and I today. If he could handle the things in Bible times, he can sure handle them today, and he is. We may not always understand it. We may always cry out like we're going to see those in the under the throne of Almighty God crying out, Lord, how long? We may be asking the same thing when we understand some of the events that are taking place in our day. Jesus was more powerful than any emperor of the world then. Jesus is powerful than uh, more powerful than any kind of president or king today. And we need to understand that. And as we understand it more and more, we'll appreciate the word of God more and more and our study in the book of Revelation. I look forward to this study. If you can't be with us at the Quail Ridge Church of Christ, thank you so much for joining us online. Hope you have a blessed and wonderful day.